Welcome to Media in the Mix, the only podcast produced and hosted by the School of Communication at American University. Join us as we create a safe space to explore topics and communication at the intersection of social justice, tech, innovation, and pop culture. Today, we welcome School of Communication's decorated professor, Claudia Myers. Just to give you a little background on Claudia, she teaches classes such as advanced directing, advanced screenwriting, and directing actors for camera. Leading a double life outside of the SOC building, Claudia was named one of 10 filmmakers to watch by Independent Magazine in 2015. Most recently, Claudia wrote and directed Above the Shadows. It's a supernatural drama starring Olivia Thirlby, Alan Richson, Jim Gaffigan, and Megan Fox. The film opened the 2019 Brooklyn Film Festival, where it won the Audience Award for Best Narrative Feature and was released theatrically last summer by Gravitas Ventures and is now streaming on Hulu. Other projects include Fort Bliss, starring Michelle Monaghan, Ron Livingston, and Pablo Schreiber, Kettle of Fish, with Matthew Modine and Gina Gershon, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and won a Nickelodeon Screenwriting Award, and The Long Road Back, which was a documentary about the recovery process of soldiers injured in Iraq. As a filmmaker, Claudia has won numerous awards, was twice a finalist for the Sundance Screenwriters Lab, and is an alum of the Hampton Screenwriters Lab. As an SOC alum myself, I've had the absolute pleasure of being taught and by learning from her. So Claudia, thank you so much for being with us here as we resurrect Media in the Mix podcast. Thanks for having me. I first wanna get into the very specific world that you're in, which is, I know you're versed in directing, working with actors, um, working directly on a movie set. Of course, for anyone who doesn't know, the entertainment industry has gone through multiple changes the last few years because of the pandemic. So while there were things that we didn't really have to think about beforehand, there are things big and small that have gone into creating a film and creating a functional, I think, film set and film environment. What are some obvious things that have changed, but also some things that maybe we wouldn't think about? I mean, I think the most obvious thing that's changed is when you look at the creation process of a movie, it usually takes place in four stages. The development stage is really about the creative process of developing the story and the script. The pre-production stage, which is everything uh, from building the team to casting the actors to finding the locations, which goes into getting ready to shoot. And then there's production, which is when you're shooting the film, and finally post-production, which is the fourth step, which is the process of editing and sound, music, special effects, and so on. And um, across these four stages, uh, the pandemic has definitely had an impact on the sort of, I hate to say positive side, but there have been some uh, developments that I think overall have increased the flexibility of the industry by allowing people to work remotely. I mean, we've seen that with Zoom across, I think, pretty much every industry, including teaching. And uh, people are now no longer um, reluctant to collaborate with, you know, people who are in other states, sometimes in other countries. And so it, it, it has kind of shrunk the world in terms of creating possibilities for work in film for people who were maybe just not in the right place in the past or couldn't, you know, free themselves up to go to L.A. or to New York or to Atlanta. So in some ways, it's increased flexibility, especially in the development and pre-production to a degree stage. And and even post-production, there are, you know, plenty of situations where directors can work remotely with editors. The software has gotten so much better. The remote connections such as Zoom and other platforms have obviously been extremely key. And then in terms of set, the big difference you see is that um, so a film set is divided into departments. Um, So there will be the art department and then there will be the camera department, among others, uh, the locations department and so forth. And these departments used to interact Um, physically, you know, very freely on set in the past. And now what you see is in in the interest of kind of minimizing the risk of, you know, spreading COVID, things got much more segmented. And that, um, especially at the height of the pandemic, when productions restarted and all these precautions were implemented, it made the process kind of cumbersome. In other words, first the art, you know, the art department comes in and dresses the set and then they have to leave and then the actors come in and then they you know, rehearse. And then it, it was it was just um, 
it was slowing things down and it was reducing kind of the free flow of information. And now I think we're kind of at a point where things are starting to normalize more. Um, so I don't think sets look and feel as different as they did at the height of the pandemic. But what has happened is there is a real cost uh, to productions of filming during a pandemic and whatever we want to call this stage we're in now, where it's still, it's still, uh, you know, it's becoming endemic and where it's something we have to deal with, but it is a real risk to productions. Productions of, especially on the feature side, are very expensive for the most part. Um, they, it involves a lot of people working closely together, so there's a real risk of transmission. And budgets now have line items for COVID, COVID contingencies, and they are hefty because if you're a $20 million movie and one of your actors gets sick and you have to shut down production for a week, that is going to cost you a lot of money. But on a $30 million budget, it's something that can be absorbed. When you're working on an independent film and maybe your budget is $1 million or even $500,000, which is still a lot of money, by the way, but, <laughs> <laughs> but in the scope of you know what productions cost, I'm talking about feature films here, for example, shutting down production for a week and keeping everybody uh, around, you know, they can't take other work, they can't leave often if you're, you know, on location somewhere, that is hugely expensive. And that can, that has really dealt a blow to independent filmmaking, especially on the lower end, or it's really squeezed already tight budgets to, uh, to, to accommodate that because investors need to know that the movie is going to get finished. And now we have to factor in what happens if somebody gets sick. And then, um, you know, the work stops. And it's just more likely possibility, unfortunately, than it used to be. And so now it's it sort of has to be baked into the mm -hmm. to the budgeting and, and even the financing process. That makes a lot of sense. There was a, a more, I guess, unknown factor that came to the film rather than this idea before the pandemic of, OK, this is our process, A, B, C, D, and we're just going to follow it and kind of bring it to to the end. But now I'm noticing a lot more production companies, whether it be the production companies or just, you know, the the crew are making these really hard decisions based on kind of the the fate of what they believe will be of the film once it's it's distributed. Yeah, I think in practice, though, if a film is complete, um, COVID is not going to be the reason it doesn't get finished. I think the real risk to productions is that COVID interrupts production and ends up costing more money than the production can afford if they didn't properly budget for it. Mm -hmm. And the shutdown can basically derail the whole thing and prevent completion. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's just something that producers have to take into account, just that there's this, this curveball that can sort of be thrown at the process and that people have started to, you know, adjust for like, like so many things. But it, but it definitely has a disproportionate impact on, I would say, independent filmmaking. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting follow-up to this conversation as well, because I remember when I was taking your directing classes, some of the things that you put a lot of emphasis on, which I absolutely still follow till this day, is that relationship that you create with your crew. And I know as the director, you're, re you're really responsible for your actors. It means this relationship that you want to build, this trust that you want to build on set, or even to think about the table read. The fact that the table reads had to start happening online. Do you think that that played a part in how much you could build a relationship? I mean, do you think it was possible to even build that same relationship and trust and and closeness rather than having it, you know, be on Zoom? I know a lot of people are, are even talking about how now interviews are, are on Zoom and, and things like that to where do you think that that's kind of changing how maybe we can even build relationships? Do you think it'll take longer? It's a really interesting question because I think there are pros and cons. I've definitely done more work pre-pandemic, but I have uh, worked on a, a very interesting project with actors where the entire rehearsal process was remote. And I felt like we developed quite a good um, understanding, quite a good way of communicating. We were very productive. And then meeting in person when we were ready to start the project was kind of exciting in a different way. So it, it still wouldn't be my preference just because I think there's something about being in the space with another person that I find uh, enjoyable. And I like the, you know, being with someone face to face is kind of, uh, it's hard to replace. But I would say that, you know, the ability to work remotely has also facilitated so many things so that if, you know, you can't, 
get the person flown to New York to start rehearsals when you want. Well, you do the table read on Zoom and then you get everybody. So I, I do think there are benefits. I think the difference when you now, you know, work face to face with people is um, I think before the pandemic, I was very comfortable kind of interacting physically with my actors, you know, shaking their hand at the beginning of the day or giving them a hug or putting my hand on their shoulder just as a way of, you know, just kind of interacting with them in a in a uh, sort of um, friendly but also kind of very direct way. And I would think twice about that now. I mean, maybe, you know, there'll be a lot more fist bumping. Um, so there's, there's just a level where I'm more cognizant that some people may be uncomfortable if I kind of enter their personal space in ways that I don't think I would have thought about before. Um, but the thing about, I think, anyone in the creative world is I feel like people are infinitely adaptable. And I think... Um, Ultimately, it's all about the work, and it's about developing trust. And um, I think there are ways to do that. You know, uh, if you can't be face to face, I certainly think there are other ways to do that. And and the questions that you want to ask and the things that are important are still fundamentally the same, even if the interaction is a little different. Very cool. All right. So. Assuming you do make it through production and the film comes to completion, you're excited about this. Can you explain, because this is actually something I've started to learn a little bit more than, uh, more about as we dive into this world of streaming versus theater, you know, versus box office. But uh, can you explain a little bit about this work for hire versus independent filmmakers? Because I think they both experience very different things. Yeah, absolutely. Um and I think the, the the broader context here is that, you know, the distribution landscape it was already evolving. And then it has kind of, um, I think the change has accelerated uh, during the pandemic. And the change essentially that we're seeing is that uh, fewer people are going to the movie theaters and that to justify a theatrical release, the film has to have a pretty broad appeal. So that's why we're seeing a lot of superhero movies or animated films or um, sort of event movies. And more people are watching from home first because that was the only way to watch films when everything was, you know, during the, the lockdowns. Also because it it is a um, it is sort of the way of the future. It's how people watch, consume content. And so the streamers have sort of emerged as the new studios of right now. I mean, they're they're sort of filling that role. They're generating more content. They're commissioning more both series and, and, and films. And so you have two kind of filmmakers will approach the process differently depending on whether they have been hired by a Netflix or an Amazon Prime or Hulu or, or so forth to direct or produce something for them because then they know exactly what the distribution of that project looks like. They know exactly who they're targeting and they're working, you know, hand in hand with the distributor, essentially. Whereas uh, in my case, I, you know, write and direct projects independently. I make them and then I sell them or I license the worldwide rights to a, uh, dis you know, um, a sales company that will then sell individual territories and sometimes license it to a streamer. But once it's done, so there, those are the sort of the two ways that streamers and even, you know, regular studios acquire content. They either create it and they own it or they license it. And um, or I suppose they could also buy it outright. But, you know, as filmmakers, you either know going in you're going to be working under the umbrella of a process that's going to have a distribution outlet built in or you go in independently and hope to find distribution. That's very cool. There's a, a, a lot of talk right now about streaming services like Netflix, for example. A lot of people have this argument that Netflix is more quantity over quality. Do you have anything to say about that? And when I say quantity over quality, just for everyone listening, I mean that people tend to find so many movies and TV shows and, and content on Netflix, but rarely do they find one that they could actually like and, and enjoy and kind of get into. It's that, you know, argument of so many clothes in my closet, I don't have anything to wear. So if, if you have, I just wanted to see if you had an opinion on that because I thought that was pretty interesting. It's an interesting question because I think um, Netflix was ahead of the game early on. They got onto the streaming service. They dominated. They were 
You know, when people say watch something, they say watch Netflix as a kind of a, a stand in for all the other services. You don't say like, hey, I'm going to go home tonight and watch Amazon Prime. Right, right. I think there's a you know, potentially they overexpanded. Potentially they, you know, I, I don't I don't think any executive or, or, or streamer studio ever intentionally decides, well, we're gonna, it doesn't matter if it's good. We're just going to make it. I don't think from my experience dealing with executives that that's how it works. I think and I don't know Netflix well enough to really be able to comment on whether that's even completely true. Mm-hmm. Um because I have seen content on Netflix that I think is quite strong. It's also true that when I compare it to a service like, you know, HBO, there's a um, they, they do produce fewer shows and the, the, you know, maybe in aggregate the quality is. But again, it's subjective, you know. So, you know, I do feel like they they're a little more innovative. They're edgy. You know, they have also a brand that's in some ways more clearly defined than Netflix, which is so yeah. broad and it's trying to capture so many audiences. And I think, I mean, I, I do think that we're there's there's a little bit of a bubble here. And I think what's going to happen is now all everybody's getting into the st- streaming game. Mm-hmm. And I think some of the streamers will make it and emerge stronger or they'll merge. And I think so we're going to sort of see a little bit of that happening. And, you know, if, if history's any guide, Netflix will probably adapt and evolve and and get better is my guess, but but maybe not. And so I, I just think it's an interesting time. I think it's tough to generalize for a service overall. But then again, it's not like I, you know, have every service under the sun. I think people are now trying to decide how many are worthwhile. So there's a, you know, at first there was a, a, a curiosity and a novelty about what library comes with what service. And now, you know, streamers are courting customers in terms of like, well, this is our brand. And, you know, if you like edgy content, you know, sign up with us. Or if you like, uh, you know, family shows, then then you're probably going to want Disney Plus. And I think people are, you know, streamers are trying to figure out their their kind of uh, their corporate identity, I suppose. Um, so it's an interesting time. But I, I, I just I find it hard to generalize because I'll find you you. There's not one place that I consistently go to find a particular movie. If I'm looking up a movie, I just go to whoever's showing it. And so I don't know if my behavior is typical, but that's what I find myself doing. That makes a lot of sense. And I think there's something to be said about the fact that once the pandemic hit, there was a lot of time. And and I know that obviously there's an argument for not a lot of things could get made, but for the things that were able to get made uh, prior to all these sh- you know shutdowns and lockdowns happening – you could tell that there was just this overflow of, you know, the social media world kind of blew up a little bit as well with all these content creators. There was like an overload of content, I found. And I think that, in a sense, also made people a little frazzled. And so I think they're looking at quantity and maybe not appreciating the quality anymore because we're just kind of getting, you know, content from all these different streaming services, Everything that's happening online, content creation is becoming so much more apparent. And it's kind of this, um, I don't know, interesting place between like a film or a TV show, but also like, you know, social media content. Like there are content creators that are coming out with things that almost feel like shorts to me, like they feel like a short film. Hmm. So it's just really interesting because I think without realizing it, it doesn't have to be that you're watching Netflix, but I think you're getting this overload of content from so many different places that people might almost feel like, well, I, it's so much overload that I can't even focus on the quality anymore. So I don't know. I think sometimes that's, in, like you said, it's subjective. But I, I definitely saw that happening, which was very interesting. And yeah, I think more and more people are, are realizing the, which I always thought, you know, the beauty of film. I always like to think I got into film a lot earlier than I did because it's so easy for you to kind of nowadays especially pick up a phone pick up a video camera and kind of create something that's your own and I think the correlation to that is that I think it's going to contract as well I don't think the level of content creation right now is sustainable in the long term interesting why do you think that I just think everyone's throwing money at streaming yeah uh and and People are starting to, like I said, people are going to start to. There, there is a, there is a little bit of an overload. Like it used to be when before streaming, you know, there were only certain shows on TV, and everybody watched those shows or knew about those shows. And then there was maybe HBO and maybe Showtime. There are now so many sources for, you know, what is popular culture. There are so many shows that it's very hard to break through. And I just think 
the nature of you know the, the the economic model we have is that if it if if you can't you know sustain growth and revenue then you're going to fold and so I I do think I I don't at least under this current model where you know people can't afford to have on on average I don't think people can afford to have more than a couple of subscriptions yeah. maybe two three four how many people have you know eight or nine um, I don't know um, but I suspect. Even those that did during the pandemic are going to scale back, especially economically, given what we're going through. So I, I do think there are going to be new innovative ways of, of creating content like you're talking about. Mm. But I think in terms of the streamers, we're, at, we're, we're nearing capacity in terms of how much can they put out. And there's also a backlog, what I'm understanding from my managers, for example, is that there is a, there's a backlog of... Um, you know, of shows and films that were commissioned before the pandemic where production was stalled. And now they've already ordered those shows. They've paid for the scripts. They've licensed, you know, the underlying material, let's say the books or so forth. And now they've, you know, they they, they have to deliver these, these movies and so, uh, or these shows. And I think that's happening too. A lot of the, you know, they're, they're, they're already behind kind of on what they've, on what they've committed to. And this uh, also just going back to like the overload of streaming as well, this irony that we're starting to bundle streaming, which is kind of like what we did with television, which is like it's just replaying itself in a different way. So uh, honestly, we kind of are going back to like those cable bundles that we wanted to avoid with streaming services. And now it's just kind of taken on a whole new world, which I guess just adapted to like modern, exactly. you know, modern technology. But I always find it hilarious that we're kind of just going right back to what we were doing about 10, 20 years ago. Yeah, although I think a lasting trend that has uh, that has changed and I think was cemented during the pandemic, although it certainly started way before that, is binge watching. That is a, that, that is something that has come from streamers that they, you know, that they they put out an entire show. If you like it, you can just keep watching it. Um, I feel like that's a that's a, a new kind of pattern of watching media. It's a different way of watching a miniseries or a show when you watch it all within three days. It feels very different. You process it differently than mm -hmm. than we used to. So I just kind of interesting in terms of how the out the, the sort of the framework of the pandemic influenced people's behavior and how it kind of continues to play out. And just out of curiosity, just like a follow up to that, do you think that changes how people will create the story? You know, when you're watching a TV show that comes out every Monday night, you know, you have that like, OK, I'm going to leave it on this cliffhanger because, you know, I know the audience has one more week to watch. Um, do you think this idea of binge watching is kind of changing that like appeal a little bit or do you think eh, not at all? It's it's still possible to do that and kind of keep them hanging on. I don't know if it is affecting how we tell stories, at least mm -hmm. not in my understanding, but that doesn't mean it couldn't. I think it's more about how we watch than how we create, but maybe I'm wrong. I have to give that some more thought. I want to shift now. We've talked a lot about the pandemic. Th this is actually something I've thought about a lot as I've thought about the ideas that I might want to do in the future, um, movies that I would like to direct. Number one, any advice for this? But number two, any challenges you faced or anything you could, you know, lend a helping hand to the idea of working on topics that you feel maybe you don't have enough expertise in. So for example, um, movies like The Long Road Back, Above the Shadows, things like that where you feel like maybe, oh, do I have enough expertise? Is there a way for you to get versed in these topics? But basically, uh, do you have any advice for people who maybe are shying away from doing projects that you feel like, okay, I can't pull from anything personal. Can I still do this? It's such an interesting question um, because I sort of have two thoughts about it. The first thought is I do think you need to know why you want to tell the story. And there has to be some personal connection, I think, to be able to justify you being the best person to tell the story. But that doesn't mean you need to know or even come from uh, you know, a particular world or have experienced a particular situation to have something to say about it. So I, I just sort of want to frame it as I think having as an artist, having a personal connection to the story you're telling and having some personal belief about the story and some sort of underlying meaning you want to convey is critical. But in terms of, you know, presenting worlds that are unknown or only partially understood, 
that is the beauty of research. And um, as both a writer and a director, I think one of my great pleasures is immersing myself in worlds that I sometimes know very little about, but I am drawn to for whatever reason. So in the, you know, in, in Above the Shadows, um, you know, there's, as you, as you referred to, there's a, there's a substantial MMA element. One of the characters played by Alan Richson is, uh, you know, a disgraced MMA fighter. And I knew exactly thematically why I wanted him to be an MMA fighter, mm -hmm. but I knew very little about the sport. And so I, you know, learned all kinds of ways, including taking a jujitsu class. Really? And, and I took an MMA class. That's and I took really cool. boxing. I was not very good at any of these things, but that was beside the point. I wanted to feel what it was like to to experience, you know, what the sport is about. Any other advice? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did a lot of things. I um I interviewed people. Mm. Um I think Curiosity about any field is often rewarded with people wanting to share, wanting to talk about their experiences. And one of my favorite questions when I'm asking an expert, whether it's a, you know, an MMA fighter, whether it's, you know, a sponsor, anybody in that area, it's asking them, what do they feel people misunderstand about their work or their, or their world? And uh, what do they wish people know, knew? And also just what are the rewards of this particular profession or activity. So I think just going in with, with curiosity, with a complete lack of judgment. Like I said, I did interviews. I observed people. I watched. Uh, you know, I went to fights. I, I got to know people. And, uh, you know, on the in a, in a very different realm with my film Fort Bliss, which was about a female army medic, I had actually done five different projects with the military. Three were documentaries and two were, you know, training films. One was, for example, about combat stress and mental health issues and readjustment challenges, you know, in a similar way, observing, shadowing people at work. Uh, interviewing, you know, soldiers all up and down the chain of command, enlisted officers and so forth, and just getting a really in-depth picture of the work and the and the issues that I wanted to portray um, gave me the confidence to feel that this will never be my personal experience, but I feel like I understand it um, in enough depth and nuance that I can portray it truthfully. Are you ever met with people that are like, huh, why are you here? Like, wh what do you want to learn? What do you want to research? Or have you had experiences where people are really receptive to that and they're like, oh, that's really cool. Uh, we actually appreciate that you, you know, you want to learn more about that. You know, it's interesting. I don't think I've ever had anybody. They're curious about why I want to learn more about something. Mm -hmm. But once I explain to them what I'm trying to do and why I care about it and what I'm trying to learn because I don't want to be superficial and I want to kind of understand where they're coming from, I think there's a real appreciation for, you know, a writer, director being curious. And I mean, I've, I've done that kind of research in, in so many areas and I've always... You know, sometimes getting that initial access can take a little time, and sometimes you have to be both patient and persistent. But I've found it really, like, overwhelmingly rewarding, and um, and that people, once they understand that you're not there to kind of, you know, you, you really just are there to learn, um, they're they're often very welcoming and and sometimes grateful to have a chance to to share their perspective. That's amazing. That's good to hear. I heard it here first because I feel like that's important for some people to know or people who may, might be interested in, in directing as a career path in the entertainment industry. Can you maybe just talk a little bit about the classes that you do teach at AU and kind of the importance of them for anybody that might be interested? I mean, directing is such a multifaceted job, right? They're just, it encompasses so much. But, you know, there are two two classes I teach that I think are really critical, also, in my view, really fun. Um, one is uh, directing actors, which you referred to, uh, I think, earlier in the, in the show. And it's really about demystifying the process of working with actors, learning how to speak their language, giving students tools that they can, you know, concretely use uh, knowing how to structure rehearsal and just and and really giving students a comfort level and a confidence um, in kind of shaping performance, also knowing what to look for and and how to talk about what you're looking for. Uh, and I think once students have those tools, you can sort of really see them, you know, see their work kind of reach a new level. So that's a very gratifying class. And then um, the other directing course that I teach here at American is advanced directing, which is what it sounds like. <laughs> it is a very challenging class, but it's it's wonderful. It, it, it sort of is a precursor to students doing a capstone 
thesis project, essentially. And uh, students, you know, will uh, direct and effectively produce or co-produce a, um, everyone works on their own short film, somewhere between, you know, eight to 10 minutes, you know, from start to finish. So we go through all four stages of filmmaking that I mentioned at the very beginning, you know, the development, pre-production, production, and post, you know, over the course of 15 weeks, uh, students are expected to work with trained actors. They're expected to, you know, be working at a professional level in, in every respect. And I sort of guide them through the process. So it's it's really challenging. It's really fun. The results have been amazing. After the first class, we had about 50 percent of the students had their work accepted in multiple festivals. And um, and several of them, you know, won awards. It was it, it was it was great. Claudia, thank you so much for being here today, talking to us about the directing world, the pandemic. Now, hopefully we're reaching an endemic. Uh, But thank you so much for being here. This was an awesome conversation. It was my pleasure. It was fun to be here. Awesome. So check out our biweekly episodes. They're going to drop on Wednesdays on Anchor, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to support this podcast and the School of Communication, go to giving.american.edu to donate now. And that's a wrap.